encourage you to come to that. Uh, Dr. Amorosi, who's, who's a, a freshwater ecologist at the Institute, is going to do a stream ecology um, research. Uh, that's one where you want to wear uh, shorts and sneakers because you're going to get wet. Um, and uh, she might, if, if you ask her nicely, show you our artificial river system out in the uh, greenhouses on the west side of campus where Emma does work on novel pollutants, uh, so drugs and personal care products, uh, and looks at their ecological impact. So those are upcoming, um, but really I would like to focus on today. Um, now, before I do that, I have to remind people, and when we have a sold out audience, it's always a good time to remind people, you'll see some people have names on the back of their chairs. Uh, these lectures are free, and we don't have a lot of way of thanking our donors, uh, but if you become a Leopold Society member, you can reserve a few seats and have your name on the back of the chair. So if you are interested in that privilege, let me know and uh, I'll make sure you get the information you need. So um, timing is everything and it's hard to say that climate change is a, a, a timely subject. It's been a timely subject for several decades, uh, but I think society is finally coming to grips with the fact that we are uh, in a crisis. Um, and you know, two weeks ago, uh, there was the Climate Science Special Report of the federal government, 13 agencies, authors from across these agencies, uh, who came to some pretty simple conclusions um, that climate change is real, it's accelerating, and it has economic costs in the United States. And I think all, almost anywhere else in the world that would be seen as sort of odd that we have to say that. Uh, but I think as leaks go, this was a really good one because this is really important scientific synthesis. It's consensus, it doesn't mean it's covering everything, but it is summarizing um, the state of affairs, I think, pretty well. And I can't think of a better person to have here to talk to us about that in the history of climate science and, and climate policy than Phil Duffy. Um, Phil's career as an expert on climate change sort of bridges academia, government and nonprofit in a way that is both interesting and unusual. People usually go to academia and stay there. They go to a federal lab and stay there. They go to a nonprofit and stay there. Um, I'm guilty of that. I've spent 18 years in one nonprofit. Um, but Phil's, you know, after completing his uh, AB in astronomy and astrophysics at Harvard, went on for a PhD in uh, applied physics at Stanford. And then he took up what would have been a traditional position uh, at the Lawrence Livermore Labs where he was on uh, staff until 2015. But in between and amongst all that, he was a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Institute for Science, at the Woods Institute for Environment at Stanford. Uh, he spent four years culminating as the chief scientist at Climate Central, which is a nonprofit that works to help educate people about climate change. He spent three years in the Obama White House, uh, both as the uh, National Science and Technology Council and the Office of Science and Technology Possible. Office of Science and Technology Policy, sorry, OSTP, we we'll almost never use anything but the acronym, uh, on issues related to climate policy. Uh, and then he did Camp Washington uh, and moved to uh, Woods Hole, where he is now the president and uh, executive director of the Woods Hole Research Center. Uh, I will just say a couple words about the center because it too is an independent research institute. Uh, it too focuses on uh, the science uh, of uh, ecosystems, but particularly the science of climate change in two particular areas, the Arctic and tropical forests. And if there are two places where we are gonna see impacts of climate change, uh, the Arctic and the tropical forests are, are really good places to look. Uh, so as a constant ad, uh, academic, a passionate advocate for uh, educating uh, the public about climate, and a really seasoned policy analyst. It is a privilege and a pleasure uh, to welcome Phil to the Cary Institute. Thank you, Josh, thank you so much. And thank you all for, for coming out on a rather dreary uh, Friday night. Uh, you know, as Josh said, I've been working on various aspects of, of climate change. 25 or 30 years now, um, and the last the last 10 months have been difficult. Um, and uh, in fact, my wife Lauren and I were in uh, Marrakesh, Morocco, on election day, on election night. At the uh, we just arrived, I was going to the UN uh, climate negotiations, 
Uh, and it, it was, well, it was shocking. And it was, uh, it was quite an experience to be there and then to walk into that uh, venue the next morning. Uh, and everybody was asking, what does this mean? Uh, what do we do now? Uh, and that's really what uh, I plan uh, to talk about uh, tonight. Um, before I start uh, into the policy stuff, I thought I would just review a little bit about the science. And before I actually do that, I'll just say a couple of words about Woodsaw Research Center. I'm really not going to talk much uh, about us or our work, although along the way I'll point out a few things that we do. Uh, as Josh said, we're in some ways a similar institution uh, to the Carey Institute. We're a, a, an independent uh, research uh, and policy uh, entity. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we've been ranked uh, the, the world's number one uh, independent climate change think tank uh, for uh, four years in a row. This is our campus in Woods Hole. We have this, I think, smaller than this one. We have uh, only two buildings, 10 acres, lovely campus, as you can see. Uh, we're also on a path to uh, campus-wide energy uh, neutrality. Uh, and by the end of this calendar kind of year, I think we'll be there. What you don't see here, you see a rather large solar array. What you don't see just off uh, out of the frame here, we have a 100, uh, 100 kilowatt wind turbine, which generates a fair amount of our power. So with a little more generation, a little less uh, consumption, we plan to be uh, energy neutral by the end of the year. OK, so what am I going to talk about? Uh, before uh, we get into uh, the policy stuff, I just want to remind you that as we squabble over uh, the configuration of deck chairs uh, on the Titanic, that uh, climate change is marching on. So I'm going to show you some of the indicators, uh, physical indicators of uh, the continuation of climate change. Uh, I will just show you uh, what needs to be done in terms of uh, reducing emissions and removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in order to satisfactorily control the problem. I'll talk about some work at the international level and at uh, the state uh, and local level. And of course, that is really the answer to the question posed in the, in, uh, the title of my talk, it is, and, and meaning that if the federal government isn't going to do, the US federal government isn't going to do what they're supposed to do, then the other actors have to do more. We have to do more at the international level. We have to do more uh, at the state and federal level and the independent entities like uh, Woodsville Research Center, like the Kerry Institute, also doing more. Um, people always ask, you know, what can we do? I'll talk about that. And then just, just to cheer you up a little bit, because you're going to need it, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll give you some reasons that you to, to feel good. And there are actually are reasons to feel good. Um, so just to remind you, you all know, climate change is caused by uh, the buildup uh, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This, of course, is caused primarily by fossil fuel use. It's also caused by uh, some land use policies, principally uh, deforestation. Uh, and what it, you, you see hints of that in this little seasonal up and down, <coughs> up and down. And what, is that, what that is caused by, what that represents, is the annual greening and browning of vegetation uh, in the northern hemisphere. And what that reminds us of is that uh, we can that we can actually use uh, land management to remove uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Nature does it every spring, and you can see uh, the effects here. Um, this is a, a, a longer perspective on uh, the concentration of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So this is where we are today. You can see just this this rapid build up here. Why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because you often hear people say, oh, climate will be changed, there are natural cycles, this is a natural cycle. Well, okay, here's a natural cycle, okay? Here's, here's what's happened in the last 100 years. So obviously, it's not part of uh, a natural cycle. Uh, this natural cycle is the cycles of uh, glaciation and, and, and interglaciation. We understand what causes those. Uh, we, we understand the timing. We can predict those cycles. Uh, if not for human interference in the climate system, we would now be in a slight cooling trend. The natural, the natural cycles uh, would put us in a slight cooling trend. Okay, so I promised to show you some of the basic physical indicators uh, of climate change. This is the one everybody likes to look at. It's actually not the best one. This is what we call near-surface air temperature. It's 
what people think of as temperature or temperature measured at weather stations at the bottom of the atmosphere. The, the title here says three, the last three years have been the warmest years uh, on record. You notice uh, in the early part of the century, there was uh, 10 years or so where it seemed to be, uh, the, the temperature seemed to be relatively flat, and, and of course the climate change in Earth went crazy about that. Uh, and you know, it, it was somewhat of a scientific mystery why, and still is somewhat of a scientific mystery why that happened, but we had zero doubt that the warming would resume. And we had zero doubt that the warming would resume because we know that the, the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere, the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was continuing. Uh, and you can see if you look back on the record, there are other periods where the temperature's been flat or going down. And, 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 and you expect that. And, and what that essentially says is that this temperature record reflects many uh, forces, only one of which is the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Now, I mentioned that this is, this is everybody's favorite climate indicator. I said it's not the best. The reason it's not the best, one, is that if you think of uh, greenhouse warming as an accumulation of energy in the planet, which is exactly what it is, uh, where, and ask yourself, where is that energy going? Uh, almost none of it actually is going into the atmosphere. Uh, most of it, nearly all of it, goes into the ocean. About 1% goes into the atmosphere. So it's not the best place to look for warming. Uh, we look there, though, for two reasons. One is that we live in the atmosphere, so we care about it. Uh, the other is that it's very well observed because we live there. This is the ocean, uh, a record of the heat content uh, of the ocean is less well observed, but as I said, you know, if, if, if you break down where the extra energy that's accumulating on the planet Earth is going, about 93% of it, we think, uh, is going in the ocean. So this really tells you, this is where to look for warming. Uh, the ocean is, is heating. Um, this is showing the record of uh, sea ice uh, in the northern hemisphere, the black line, uh, is observations and everything else is various model simulations. I put the model simulations on there to make the point that the sea ice is actually disappearing faster than the simulations uh, think they should. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm making that point because you, you will often hear climate change and Iris go, oh, these computer models are crazy, they predict way too much warming. That's not always true. Uh, here's a case where the models are under predicting actually uh, the progress of climate change. Okay, this is now land ice. That was sea ice. This is the southern hemisphere. That's the northern hemisphere. This is part of the, 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 the Antarctic uh, ice sheet, which is a massive, massive piece of ice. This is showing uh, accelerations. These are measurements made from satellites showing accelerations in the horizontal motion uh, of these glaciers. The horizontal motion meaning motions towards uh, the sea. And so what's happening is these ice sheets are uh, destabilizing, disintegrating, and the ice is accelerating uh, into uh, the water. Okay, and that's, of course, uh, going to result uh, in sea level rise. And what we worry about is that these things uh, are sort of like corks in a bottle. If, you know, once if you move this piece of ice out of the way, it makes it easier for the other ice uh, to slide uh, downhill. And, and, and largely because of the uh, disintegration and the accelerated disintegration of the Antarctic ice sheet, which I just showed you, and also Greenland, sea level rise is not only continuing, uh, but uh, accelerating. And, and that's shown here on this slide. And this is measurements of sea level rise. The red measurements are made from uh, space, from satellites. We've had those for uh, 20 or 25 years. The blue measurements are made from tide gauges, which are fine, but only measure sea level at the coastline of satellites measure sea level rise uh, everywhere. So again, sea level rise is accelerating. The main reason is the acceleration of uh, the increased inputs from uh, the disintegration of the major land ice sheets. And, and because of that, and because our understanding of the ice sheet physics is improving, uh, our projections of future sea level rise have been revised upward and revised upward and revised upward several times, and I'm just showing you an example here. This is from uh, the latest uh, assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was released uh, in 2013, and this shows a 
high end projection by 2100 of a meter of sea level rise. Okay, uh, this is this figure on the left is from uh, the infamous uh, climate science special report, which there was an article I think, I think it was last week in the New York Times. Uh, this was this is a an in progress draft report as part of the latest national climate assessment. It was leaked uh, to the New York Times because there's some concern that the Trump administration would actually release this thing. I got it, actually, this is not from the leaked version. I was on, there was a National Academy of Sciences review of this thing, and I was on that panel. Uh, but well, anyway, the point is, this shows a high-end projection of 2.4 meters, so much higher uh, project, a high-end projection of sea level rise. And again, it's because our understanding of the potential disintegration of the ice sheets, uh, the major land ice sheets, is, is developing. And, and, and again, the main, the main concern of, as far as that goes is, is sea level rise. Uh, and what this says, what the slide says is that if the Greenland ice sheet were to totally disintegrate, uh, which would take centuries uh, to actually happen, uh, then we would have uh, about 23 feet of sea level rise. If the Antarctic ice sheet were to completely disintegrate, we would have uh, much more, almost 200 feet of sea level rise. Now again, uh, for that to actually happen would take several hundred years probably. But what may be much closer than that is the point of no return, is the point beyond which uh, that becomes unstoppable. And we had a speaker last night uh, at Woodsville Research Center, uh, a paleo climate scientist who, who looks at and looked at climate of the past, and she was looking at it and showed us that if you look at the Pliocene, uh, which was uh, about three million years ago, uh, the, the carbon dioxide concentration was just what it is now, about 400 parts per million. And uh, in that era, uh, sea level, uh, they think, was about 10 meters higher uh, than it was now. Uh, also, if you look at uh, the last interglacial, which is much closer in time, about 115,000 years uh, ago, uh, again, the temperature, the global temperature was about uh, what it is now, and we think sea level rise was six to nine meters higher than it is now. What that suggests is that uh, even without further emissions of greenhouse gases, if we simply wait, uh, we will experience six, nine, ten meters of sea level rise, which is really, uh, well, depending on where you live, really a lot. Uh, okay, so that's um, uh, just an overview of some of the major physical indicators of climate change, and, and I'm going to show you just one or two slides on uh, what it would take to avoid uh, some of these catastrophic outcomes. And I should say that the good news on sea level rise uh, is that our policies really will have, we think, have a big influence on the rate of sea level rise uh, for the rest of the century. So uh, we do have some control over at least how fast this happens, and, and also over how much over the sea level rise uh, we do experience, and over other Okay, I, I want to just re remind you of something you probably already know, but this is a, a, a useful way to look at things. I showed you uh, that climate change is caused by, or I asserted that climate change is caused by the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it's useful to think about uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as water in a bathtub, okay? And so uh, burning fossil fuels and, 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 and deforestation and agriculture, things that add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere are like uh, the spigot. And a lot of climate policy focuses on uh, turning down the spigot. Uh, but there's also a drain uh, in the bathtub, and the drain is uh, the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by uh, the ocean and also by uh, terrestrial ecosystems. And, and actually, our work at Woodsville Research Center is focused on both uh, the spigot and the drain in the sense that we work on uh, stopping the, uh, the inputs of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere that come from uh, deforestation from agriculture and so on. And we also work on implementing land management policies that accelerate the removal uh, of CO2, uh, sort of like uh, rotor rooting the strength. And what I'm going to show you in the next slide, and the next slide is kind of a mess, I'll be warning you, but what I'm going to show you on the next slide is that in order to successfully control climate change, we think that we need to do we need to work on both ends of the system. In other words, we need to shut off the spigot pretty quickly, and we need to also really uh, 
get the power snake out uh, and, 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 and open up that drain. Um, again, this is a messy slide. I, you know, my first time I saw it, I, I took spent about 10 minutes staring at it and, and to said, what the hell is this slide showing? But it, what it is, it's, it's a representative scenario that limits warming uh, to about two degrees Celsius, which is about what we think we need to do, maybe not quite enough. Uh, but, and, and what this shows is um, annual emissions, uh, human emissions of carbon dioxide uh, from uh, to the atmosphere ground. And so, and this black curve is the, the uh, what I call the net human emissions of carbon dioxide. And I'm, I'm saying it's net human emissions because what's going on for most of the period is that uh, the spigot is being shut down and uh, the drain is being opened up. So we're, for most of the, what's going on, most of the time shown here, we're both adding CO2 to the atmosphere and, and starting to remove it as well. Uh, and, and so this is the, the net, the difference of the two. So what this says is that by about 2070, uh, we need to stop, we need to be net neutral, meaning we need to have no net additions of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. But what's worrisome, I think, is that this is showing that in about 2030, we actually need to stop, I'm sorry, we need to start removing uh, substantial quantities of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a tall order. Uh, and, and, but, but that's what we think we need to do uh, in order to avoid the worst possible outcomes. And this, by the way, is the commitments that have been made so far uh, under the Paris climate agreement. So they're not good enough. They're not on the trajectory. And I'll have, I'll have more to say about that uh, in just a moment. Uh, I, I want to, if that's not discouraging enough, I want to I wanna mention that none of that analysis considers uh, greenhouse gas emissions from falling permafrost, which happens to be one of the things that we work on at Woodsville Research Center. We think it's actually a very important problem, a very underappreciated problem. Essentially, what this, this is a slide of uh, permafrost, I don't know where this is actually. You can see this, this, this slope has just slumped. You can see that these trees are pointing at a crazy angle. You can see there's a lot of ice here. Uh, so permafrost is ground that's been frozen for a very long time, typically tens of thousands of years. There's a lot of organic matter in that uh, frozen ground that hasn't had a chance to decompose because it's been frozen. Now that the Arctic is warming, the Arctic is warming about twice as fast as the rest of the planet, uh, that uh, organic matter is starting to decompose, it's starting to emit greenhouse gases. And it's, it, it, we think it will become uh, a significant source of, of greenhouse gas emissions. And what we worry about is uh, a self-reinforcing cycle wherein warming causes falling permafrost, which causes uh, release of greenhouse gases, which causes uh, more warming. And, and this is something that we don't want to get going. We don't want this self-reinforcing cycle to get going. This is one of our scientists, Sunitali, uh, at the 2015 UN climate uh, conference talking to some of the delegates about, delegates rather, about uh, the problem of, of permafrost the um, Okay, so I, I mentioned uh, a moment ago that uh, if the federal government isn't going to do uh, what they should do, uh, others have to do the work. Uh, and there's a lot going on at the international level, there's a lot going on at the state and local level, I'll just mention a few things. Um, at the international level, of course, is uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. And, you know, I, I'll be the first to admit that I was surprised that this happened. And, and I was surprised that it happened because uh, I had been following the process for 20 years, and uh, they hadn't succeeded in 20 years, and I, I assumed they wouldn't do it. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable uh, diplomatic accomplishment. And as I explain or review uh, some of the main uh, the main ways in which the agreement works, I think you'll see that it was a very cleverly uh, designed process in the sense that it was designed in a way to, that would get a lot of countries to participate, uh, but also at the same time uh, have a chance of succeeding uh, in controlling the problem. Uh, so, uh, as you may know, 195 countries, uh, soon perhaps to be 194, uh, are, are parties to the Paris Agreement now. Who, so who's not participating? Right now, who's not participating uh, is Syria, which has other things going on, uh, 
And Nicaragua, uh, Nicaragua declined to participate because they thought uh, it was not strict enough. Uh, the, the, the backbone of this process, and it really is the process, is commitments by 188 countries to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. And, and what I think is, 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 is brilliant about the way uh, the agreement works is that these commitments uh, by these 188 countries are completely independently uh, determined. In other words, each country uh, simply decides what is comfortable with in terms of a commitment and reports that uh, to the United Nations. And, and, and again, what's, what's beautiful about that is it gets a lot of buy-in because nobody feels coerced into doing something that they feel they can't do or don't want to do uh, because they can, they can make whatever commitment uh, they want. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is that uh, the sum total of those commitments might not add up to enough to actually control the problem. And I showed you that that's in fact the case. And, and so, but the designers of this process anticipated that. And so what they built into the process is that every five years, uh, every country uh, is supposed to make a new and more strict commitment. Uh, and, and the hope is that over time, the commitments will ratchet up uh, and eventually will become enough uh, to control the problem successfully. So uh, this is really very much uh, a process and the success or failure of it uh, is unknown and it will be determined by uh, how hard a lot of us work uh, to try to make it happen. And a lot of our work now at the Woodsville Research Center uh, is really focused on trying to make uh, this everyone succeed. So I want to say just a word about uh, the U.S. withdrawal. Uh, you know, I wasn't surprised by it. I wasn't, and I actually wasn't particularly uh, unhappy about it because actually it was obvious from even before uh, the inauguration, even before the election, that the Trump administration wasn't going to do, wasn't going to take the steps it would need to take in order to actually meet its commitment under this agreement. So, so given that they're not going to meet the commitment anyway, I thought it was uh, actually in some way best that they simply uh, state, uh, make their policy explicit and say, okay, we're just, we're just going to quit the process. But I, I have to add that uh, I, I was horrified by uh, the president's speech in June when he announced the withdrawal because he, what he said indicated a complete lack of understanding of how the process works. I mean, what he said is, it's not a good deal for us, we're going to renegotiate. Well, you know, I just explained to you that there actually was never any negotiation, that all these commitments are uh, individually determined, independent. In fact, that's the name that we, have, we call them, INDCs, uh, Intended Nationally Determined Contributions. They're unilaterally determined. There was no negotiation. The other thing is that uh, as part of this process, uh, any country can actually change its commitment at any time. So if the, if the president were sincerely unhappy with our commitment, if he felt it was too ambitious, he doesn't need to withdraw from the treaty, he doesn't need to withdraw from um, something not a treaty, from the agreement, uh, he doesn't need to withdraw from the process, he can simply change our commitment. He can do that unilaterally uh, at any time. And it doesn't take the consent of Congress, he can simply, he can simply do that. Um, one of the other provisions of the agreement is that uh, every other year uh, countries are supposed to measure and report their greenhouse gas uh, emissions to the United Nations. I'll have a bit more to say about that, uh, I think, in a moment. Uh, one, one of the other aspects of the treaty that President, the President uh, Trump uh, was particularly critical of is something called the Green Climate Fund. Now, the Green Climate Fund uh, is uh, a funding mechanism to help uh, developing countries fight climate change. Uh, and it's very much in our own interest to support that because uh, if you look, and I'll show you that towards the end uh, of tonight, uh, if you look at greenhouse gas emissions from the developed world, they're actually going down. Uh, where the greenhouse gas emissions are going up and where the battle to control climate change will be won and won is in developing countries. And again, it's very much in our interest to help those countries as they develop uh, to adopt renewable energy uh, rather than fossil fuels. And that's what the Green Climate Fund is for. And, and I actually think it's very important. And the amounts of money involved are relatively paltry. Uh, we, the United States had committed, I think, $3 billion. Uh, we've given them $1 billion so far. I think that's all they're going to get, which is a must, which is most unfortunate. Um, OK, so a couple of comments about uh, 
the agreement, the limitations of the agreement, as I mentioned, you know, uh, the, the, way the, the way the agreement was designed is it really does depend on participating countries uh, ratcheting up their commitments uh, periodically. Um, I really feel that self-reported greenhouse gas emissions are a problem. And this is frankly a political compromise. But if you look at um, other pollutants, other than carbon dioxide, even other greenhouse gases, uh, when there have been transitions from uh, self-reported emissions to independently measured emissions, uh, invariably uh, we find that the self-reported emissions are not really good, surprisingly. And they're almost always not very good in the, in the direction you might guess. Um, and, and actually, one of the things that we do uh, at Woodsville Research Center is we develop methods for measuring not all greenhouse gas emissions, but greenhouse gas emissions from uh, the forest sector using uh, satellite-based uh, remote sensing data. And we, and we can, and because we're in space on satellite data, we can make these measurements independently uh, and, and as a check on uh, this, the, the emissions reported uh, by these countries to the United Nations. Okay, so um, as you know, uh, the president announced uh, that the United States would withdraw from the agreement. Uh, but the, that process takes a, a number of years, and I understand that really is that the U.S. can actually be uh, out of the agreement is, is the day after, uh, interestingly, uh, the next presidential election. Um, so this is some of the comments. Uh, this one in the upper right has actually nothing to do uh, with climate change or anything else, but I like it so much. <laughs> and, and this is interesting. This is I'm somewhat of a student of, of public opinion polling on climate change. This was this poll was taken a few days before uh, the president announced U.S. withdrawal uh, from the Paris Agreement. What this and this was asking about public support for continued U.S. participation. What it shows is that all voters favor uh, continued participation by about five to one. Even self-identified conservative Republicans, uh, a small plurality uh, favors uh, continuing uh, in the agreement. So this is not a politically uh, popular step, uh, regardless of what uh, the president may think. Uh, this is also, I'm not going to show you too much more public points, but this is interesting. This is uh, this is from uh, the New York Times, an article in the Times of a, a month or so ago. Uh, and and what, the reason I selected this particular map is this is showing support for uh, strict CO2 emissions limits on existing coal-fired power plants. And, and this shows state-by-state state, uh, approval percentages uh, and the color scale is a little hard to read, but anything anything that's orange or red is, is a majority, uh, and the national average is about uh, almost 70 percent, which is very very high. And 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 you see, uh, I think every single state uh, majority of people support this policy. And the reason I, I selected this particular policy is that it is really the essence of the so-called power plan, which was one of the keystones of the Obama administration's climate policy strict limits on uh, existing uh, coal-fired power plants. Very widespread public support for that uh, across the country. One of the things that's been heartening, I think, about uh, and not just the uh, announced U.S. withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, but a lot of the other uh, retrograde policies of the Trump administration is that it's really stimulated a lot more activity on a state and local level. Uh, and right after the U.S. withdrawal was announced, uh, a bunch of states got together uh, and formed a so-called uh, U.S. Climate Alliance, and that's, those states are shown in green. I think there's actually more of them now that are shown on this map. Um, and, and what these states have agreed to is to make, uh, have their own uh, commitments to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. There's also uh, Something there's, a, there's also an alliance of, of, of cities uh, and, and who have, have united and also made pledges to uh, reduce their emissions of greenhouse gases, and those uh, are shown on the map. So a, a lot is happening uh, on the state uh, and local level. Uh, these bluish colors are states uh, which have made pledges to, 
to themselves uh, follow the U.S. commitment uh, in the Paris Climate Agreement. And so together, uh, this constitutes a fair uh, percentage of the country. Uh, you know, climate change in cities is, is, a, is particularly interesting to me uh, because the majority uh, of people in the world uh, live uh, in cities. Uh, cities uh, consume uh, a large uh, proportion of energy. Cities are responsible directly or indirectly for uh, a big majority uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions. So cities are really important in making climate smart cities uh, is really important. Cities are also, many cities are, uh, feel some of the most significant consequences of climate change as well. Many, many major cities are uh, on coast uh, and are subject to storm surge, the sea level rise, uh, various forms uh, of extreme weather. And a lot of cities and towns, some of the bigger cities and towns have, have really good resources and have done really impressive things. Uh, Boston and New York uh, come to mind, but a lot of smaller towns uh, don't have the resources uh, to understand what they're facing or uh, to cope. And that is actually one of the purposes of uh, the National Climate Assessment. And I referred a moment ago to the so-called Climate Science Special Report, which is part of the National Climate Assessment. Uh, and, and Josh, in his introduction, mentioned the climate assessment, but you know, the, the purpose of the U.S. National Climate Assessment, which is a quadrennial uh, assessment of how climate change is affecting the U.S., a big part of its purpose is to, uh, to inform preparedness so that uh, cities and states know what to expect and can take some steps uh, to buffer uh, the impacts. And this says here, yeah, over 90% of urban areas uh, are coastal. So, so uh, cities are uh, both uh, on the front lines of climate change in terms of experiencing impacts and also uh, produce most of the emissions. This, this is a little map showing showing where climate policies are are happening, and and there's more there's more going on than you may think. And there's actually even more going on than I realized. Uh, and and I, I discovered some of this about six months ago. And I'll talk a little bit about this. In, uh, in a few minutes, but I, I, about six months ago, I decided it was interesting to look at real-world <coughs> climate policies and look at their economic impacts. And the reason I'm interested in that is that one of the you know the, the big uh, argument now that the climate change deniers are, are are using, and their arguments have evolved over uh, the years and decades, uh, and they they evolved away from uh, it's not happening, it's not real. Uh, towards, well, it's happening in Israel and it's caused by humans, but we can't afford uh, to do anything about it. That will, you know, we, we implement strict climate policies, uh, we'll bankrupt ourselves. And, and what's interesting is that there's now starting to be enough experience with actual real world climate policies that you can answer that question uh, empirically. Uh, and I started to look at that uh, a little bit, and I'll show you one or two results. Uh, in a moment, but the, the point of this slide is to show you that there's a lot of jurisdictions, countries, uh, uh, provinces, states, uh, who either have climate policies like cap and trade systems uh, or uh, are contemplating uh, climate policies. And I spent most of my life in California. As you know, California is uh, really and continues to be a leader uh, in climate policy. And actually, it's a great example of uh, a jurisdiction where they always have very, very strict environmental policies, very, very strict climate policies, and yet their economy seems to be doing uh, just fine, actually. Um, so what, what can you do? And, and actually, I think you can, you, can probably, you can do more than you might think. Uh, and, uh, you know, I used to be uh, kind of pessimistic about the, uh, the value of uh, decarbonizing your life and reducing your own greenhouse gas emissions. And the reason is, of course, I mean, the truth is, um, you know, on a purely physical level, your own personal greenhouse gas emissions are utterly uh, inconsequential. But, but what's, what's, what's not inconsequential, what is actually important, is the example you set. And, 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 and your behavior influences the behavior of others. And, and as you know, at least the older folks in the audience know, what is uh, fringe behavior can quickly become mainstream. And many of us are old enough to remember when recycling was this crazy thing uh, that only hippies did. And very quickly, uh, it's, it's now universal. Uh, and, 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 and that applies to other things as well. So I, I do believe that uh, decarbonizing your life 
really has, uh, has an impact. Uh, it's also true that uh, there's probably, a, wherever you live, there's probably uh, a lot going on in your community, and, and, and your community is the level where you actually can have uh, an impact. And uh, it doesn't take a lot of people uh, <coughs> showing up uh, and, 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 and being willing to work uh, to make a difference uh, at a community level. Um, finally, I, yeah, I, really, I, I, I really believe in the value and, and the impact you can have by, by contacting your legislators at every level, again, city, uh, state, uh, and federal. And, and you know, the, the, the key message uh, when you talk to these folks, and, and, and believe me, you know, there's no point in giving them big dissertation, okay? What they're going to do is they're going to check one box or the other, for or against, okay? Uh, but the one message you can do that, that, that will get their attention is just say, this, this determines how I vote, okay? That's what they care about. Uh, and so, you know, say, I want you to support this climate legislation. This determines how I vote. That's all you need to say. Uh, and, and I guarantee that they will listen to that. The other thing that is great to do is to get involved personally uh, with uh, some organizations. There's a lot, a lot of really good organizations uh, that are uh, working on this problem in lots and lots of different ways. There's, there's uh, uh, advocacy organizations. There's uh, organizations like, like this organization and Woodsville Research Center, which approaches more from the point of view of science. Uh, there's lots of different ways you can get involved, in it, and it's, it's a really great thing to do. Um, this this came out. This was actually published in a journal. I should I should have had a story, but this was actually published in a scientific journal relatively recently, and it just quantifies the impact of various actions on greenhouse gas emissions. And what it says is the most important thing by far to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions to have a kid, have one, have not have a kid. Uh, and, and, and that got a lot of attention. And, and frankly, uh, I, don't know, I think it's perhaps more useful to look at some of these other things. <laughs> 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 um, but it, it is interesting to, to see all the things you can do. Right? And uh, people ask a lot about plant-based diets and, and they do matter. Things you can do in your home, uh, do matter. Anyway, it's interesting to have some quantitative information on this. Okay, so before I close, I want to I want to give you some reasons to feel good, and there are actually a lot of reasons to feel good. Um, we've actually made a lot of progress on this problem. The Paris Climate Agreement is, is, a, is a phenomenal uh, step. I believe uh, it will succeed. I, I believe that Trump uh, will prove to be a, a bump in the road. Uh, but uh, perhaps the most perhaps the most important thing is that the, the cost of renewable energy uh, at a utility scale uh, has just dropped so dramatically and is continuing uh, to drop. And, and since since Obama took office, uh, you know, solar energy, the price of solar energy has dropped by nearly eighty percent. The price of wind energy has dropped by sixty percent, and that's really really important because what that means is that. These, these technologies are competitive, and these markets are competitive uh, with fossil fuels, and it means also they're cheaper uh, than nuclear. And, and because of these price reductions, uh, the majority last year of newly installed capacity was actually renewable, and that's, that's, that's a really important uh, step. Uh, the other thing, as I mentioned earlier, is that uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the developed countries have actually peaked, and I'll show you, I'll just walk you through this here. This is from the United States. This is annual, whoops, the access this to, this is annual uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. It doesn't matter what the units are. What you see is the United States emissions peaked out uh, right around the start of the recession, and for a while, uh, it wasn't clear to you how much of that drop is due to recession and how much is due to uh, changes in technology. Uh, well, the recession's been over for some time, Greenhouse gas emissions are still going down. We really think that uh, for the first time we've experienced economic, sustained economic growth and continued uh, reductions in emissions, and that's really positive. Same is true in the European Union. So these are the, you know, the biggest block of developing countries. And, and another remarkable uh, story is China. Um, China took over from the U.S. a few years ago as, as the world's biggest emitter. Um, China, uh, well, a few years ago. The projections for China were incredibly pessimistic. They were going to build, I forget how many coal-fired power plants a week, and 
and their emissions were just going to go up, up, up. And as you know, the population of China is not growing very fast, but their economy has just been growing gangbusters, uh, and their energy use uh, is, is, is growing incredibly fast. But uh, those very dire predictions simply didn't happen, and I think this is an important example of how things can change more quickly uh, than you think. And what, what happened is that the Chinese government got on board with the idea that they need to invest in renewable energy, and they're spending enormous amounts of money on it. Uh, and what you see is that their greenhouse gas emissions seem to have uh, peaked uh, last year. And, and this is interesting because uh, if you remember uh, the president's speech uh, announcing U.S. withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement, he complained that the agreement was so unfair to us because the Chinese don't have to do anything uh, until 2030. Well, in fact, their pledge under the agreement was that uh, they would make their emissions peak in the year 2030, well, in fact, they've already done. Uh, they've met their commitment uh, under the agreement uh, 13 years ago. It's really, really unexpected uh, and remarkable. Uh, so it's, it's something to feel good about. Uh, India, of course, is the, the third biggest emitter, uh, and their emissions are still going up and going up very quickly. And, and you know, they're, they're a developing country. They have 300 million people who don't have access to electricity, they're a great example of uh, it's so important that they, when those 300 million people get electricity, that did not come uh, from fossil fuels. Um, well, I talked a, a moment ago about experience with real world climate policies. One of the real world climate policies that's been around for the longest time is the so called Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, uh, which is a cap and trade system on greenhouse gas emissions from the electric power sector. Uh, it includes now uh, nine northeastern states, including New York. Uh, uh, it was uh, implemented in uh, 2008. And what's interesting about Reggie is that there have now been several studies of, okay, what have the economic consequences of this, uh, this policy been? And, and what that involves is the economists digging into the numbers and trying to, and trying to uh, untangle uh, the effects of this policy from everything else. And what they've concluded is that this policy, and again, there are several studies all concluding that this policy has had positive economic uh, effects, uh, created jobs, saved money, uh, also has had uh, some significant health benefits, uh, which can be translated into dollar figure, but the health benefits result from decreased use uh, of fossil fuels. So there's some reason to think that uh, climate policies, good, well-designed climate policies, can actually help uh, economically. Uh, and, and in fact, they don't have to help economically as long as they don't hurt too much. But uh, there, again, there's reason to think that well-designed policies can be helpful economically. Now, all that, historically, you may, you may remember New Jersey uh, was originally part of Reggie, uh, the state legislature. So the state legislature withdrew uh, uh, with the support of Governor Christie because of the harmful economic consequences uh, of uh, This is actually uh, an interesting story, uh, and, and I think a, a, a one that, that applies uh, perhaps more widely. This is a story about refrigerators uh, uh, in the United States, and, and what it shows is the history of uh, refrigerator uh, energy use uh, shown in the blue curve, and, and refrigerator prices and refrigerator size. And, and it goes back to 1947, and what it shows is that starting in the 50s, refrigerators got bigger and bigger. Uh, they started using more and more, and more energy. Uh, in the mid-70s, uh, the state of California started to regulate the energy use uh, in, in, by refrigerators. Uh, that was followed by a series of, of regulations by federal government, which regulated not only energy use, but the coolants that were used in the refrigerators. And what's, what's remarkable is that the, 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 the advent of the regulations started this precipitous drop, actually, not only in the energy use by refrigerators, which was the intention, but also a drop uh, in uh, the prices of refrigerators. All of that, while the size continued to grow up and up, we all know how these enormous uh, you know, 22, 24 to the refrigerators. And, you know, I, so what's going on here? I, I think what's going on here is that uh, up until this time, uh, 
there was no reason to look at to review the design of refrigerators because um, everybody, you know, everybody was making money. Life was good. Uh, the advent of regulations caused the engineers again to look at okay, how, how can we make these refrigerators more efficient? And they found that they actually could. Uh, and so this is a case where I think where uh, regulation actually stimulated innovation, and there was actually room for innovation and room for improvement. And I, I can't believe that refrigerators are the only place uh, where this uh, can happen. So I, I think there's there, there's potential for real progress uh, on this problem. Okay, I'm, I'm really uh, <laughs> I really am almost done, but I, I just want to leave you with with one thought, and then I'll. You know, Answer some questions. And this is this is a, I'm sorry. This is a somewhat long quotation, but this I, I it is I, I I like it because it's it's a remarkable language for this from a scientific journal uh, from uh, an article that was published in the journal Nature uh, at the beginning of uh, 2016. You can read it. It says decisions being made today will have profound and permanent consequences for you, for future generations uh, as well as for the planet. The next few decades will offer a brief window of opportunity to minimize large-scale and potentially catastrophic climate change that will extend longer than the entire history of, of human civilization thus far. And, and what this is saying is that this is a critical moment, you know, that just, you know, these tipping points uh, I mentioned whereby uh, the commitment to the complete melting of green relations, that may be very, very close. And so uh, we really have a chance now to prevent those things from happening. Uh, and if we don't take that chance, uh, the consequences will, will be very, very long with indeed. Well, thank you again, and, and, and I'll be happy to answer some questions. Both non-ozone destroying and non-ozone 
so that is, yeah, it is a, it is a, a, a real one, real one issue. Can you speak to the, uh, or quantify the permafrost effect? Is there any projections about that? The one you yes, um, but again, this is something where uh, how much, you know, how much, how much greenhouse gas is coming from permafrost really? It does depend on on other policies, okay? Uh, but the you know the the thinking is that uh, by the end of, of cumulative emissions from falling permafrost by the end of the century, uh, I'm trying to remember the numbers. I think the number is like uh, 100 billion tons of carbon. And what does that mean? Uh, that means the equivalent of and years worth of global emissions now. So it's actually a whole lot. Uh, and it's, again, it's, it's, you know, it's important that that not get out of control. The, the other thing that's interesting, I'll just digress for a moment and talk about permafrost. The, the other thing is the story of, is of permafrost is an important example, I think, of how science has failed uh, policymakers. And the reason I say that is that um, the the science that is used to inform uh, the UN climate negotiations completely ignores greenhouse gas emissions from falling permafrost, which is actually, as I just said, potentially very, very important. And how could that be? And how could that have come to pass? And, and, and the way that that came to pass was that the, the folks like me who developed climate models uh, felt that they didn't understand well enough the physical processes that produce greenhouse gas emissions from falling permafrost, so they simply left it out of the models. Okay? Scientists hate to be wrong. Uh, and, and so, but what they did then is that by leaving this process out of the models, that's equivalent to assuming that uh, the answer is zero, and we know that that's not right. Uh, and, and, and so they, they, you know, the policies that the UN was using, uh, the scenarios that the UN was using to design climate policies are completely ignored. This, this potentially important source of emissions. And actually, a couple of years ago, uh, right before the, the Paris uh, summit, uh, we sent a, a little delegation of Arctic scientists down to talk to the State Department people who, who, who uh, represented the United States uh, in those negotiations. Uh, and we gave them a little story about falling permafrost, and they kind of went, oh crap, how come, you know, how come we didn't know this? Uh, and, and, and again, you know, the reason is that you know, the scientific community, I think, didn't didn't serve the policy community uh, uh, well. And, and unfortunately, that does happen. Yeah. Um, to what extent did the Paris Climate Agreement rely on its projections on assuming that things like carbon sequestration would help mitigate the effects of climate change? And to what extent should we, we, be, we be worried about those assumptions? What a great question. <laughs> Have you been doing some reading? I don't really read about it. But yeah, no, look, I mean, you, you know, you, you, hit, you hit one of my, you hit one of my pet peeves, okay? And I'll, I'll go back to this slide. Um, uh, and this is this horrible slide, but, uh, you know, again, this is, a, this is a representative scenario that, when it's warming to about two degrees Celsius. Uh, and this shows so-called negative emissions, uh, CO2 removal starting at about 2030. And by the end of the century, the amount of those negative emissions, it's a little hard to read this, but uh, it's sort of like uh, 15 uh, gigatons tons CO2 equivalent a year. Uh, what is that? That's about, uh, well, that's a significant fraction of total global emissions today. Okay, so it's an enormous amount of CO2 removal. And I'll be honest, you know, my first, my first awareness of this was, uh, as part of my job in the White House, I represented the United States in, in, in the, the discussion of these uh, so-called IPCC reports. And, this, you know, these are, and, and those reports are finalized uh, in these enormous international contacts where dip diplomats from 195 countries uh, get together. And actually, one of the things that's interesting about that process, okay, so the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change is essentially a scientific body which produces reports summarizing what we understand about climate science, and that's sort of 
that understanding is used by the negotiators who actually negotiate the agreements. Uh, but what's interesting about that process is that uh, those scientific summaries are produced by scientists, but they're approved by the scientists. And, and the, the, there, there are each of those uh, so-called assessment reports has three or four summary documents, and each of those summary documents, I mean, the reports themselves are a thousand pages times three volumes, three thousand pages, but the summary documents are thirty-five pages uh, or so. But what's interesting is that every sentence, literally every sentence in each one of those thirty-five page summary documents is approved by those 195 countries. And not only that, they're approved unanimously by 195 countries. And one of my jobs was to push, to represent the United States and pushing that process along. Now the reason I mention that is that, so those documents have statements along the lines of, you know, essentially all the warming is caused by humans. And so it's, it's really important to understand that that's, those statements are not only from us, you know, produced by hundreds of scientists, but they're actually approved and approved unanimously by diplomats from 195 countries. So that's really, really, those are really, really powerful statements. One thing that's true also, though, is that because of the way that process works, because it requires, because every single statement requires unanimity, what you end up with is actually very cautious statements. And, and you know, the climate change deniers say that, oh, the IPCC is one, and nothing could be further from the truth. Okay, that's a long digression. But, uh, you know, I, the, 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 my, my experience in uh, representing the U.S. in these discussions was the first time I actually looked at this entire volume of intergovernmental panel on climate change, which is these economic models which do all these scenarios. And I was frankly horrified when I saw, you know, these massive so-called negative emissions. And I said to myself, what the hell is that? What the hell is that? You know, massive amounts of carbon dioxide removal, and how, how exactly is that supposed to happen? And, and that's supposed to happen, according to these models, by something called bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And there's an acronym for that, which is VEX. And what that essentially is, is growing bioenergy, growing some sort of biofuel. Uh, you burn it, uh, and you capture the CO2 when you bury it on the ground. And it's a kind of a cool idea, actually, because it's, it's the only thing known to man uh, that both produces energy and removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and then removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere because the growing, the growing biofuel pulls CO2 out of the atmosphere, and then you, bet you, you do combust it, but you don't let that carbon dioxide go back in the atmosphere. You, you capture it and bury it. It sounds great. The problem is we actually, I, I won't say we don't know how to do it, done it a little bit on a very, very small scale, but we've never done it at anything like this massive, massive scale. Uh, in my opinion, it's kind of science fiction. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's really like, outrageous that we essentially bet the farm on this technology, which is, is, is unproven at anything like the scale we need. Okay, that was probably much more than you wanted to do. <laughs> Let me take one, two more questions, gentlemen. By the way, if we can add to that, yeah. I think the peak efficiency of those biomass to electricity yeah. panels is under 30%. Yeah. So, my question is, 405 parts per million of CO2, um, is there a reliable range of numbers for the CO2 equivalent in addition to that for the citrus that we released for methane out of natural gas systems and all the other units? Okay, you're asking about other, right. yeah, other greenhouse gases, and if you put that, uh, yeah, I'm not sure the numbers. I think if, I'm not sure. Uh, if, if you look at the annual emissions, which is not what you're asking about, you're asking about the concentration of energy. If you look at emissions, non-CO2 gases, I think, are about 30% of the CO2. Uh, you know, we tend, we, we tend to worry more about carbon dioxide because it stays in the atmosphere for a, a longer time. Methane is a very, very potent greenhouse gas, but it doesn't last that long. Uh, and that's why we really tend to focus on carbon dioxide, because it has a very, has a very, very long way down. Let me take one or two more questions. Someone in the back. Um, I was wondering if 
you're able to follow what's going on in Washington at the EPA these days, and if there's anything you know of that has you very concerned in terms of, <laughs> <laughs> besides the fact that there's a new person who's running it, but um, in terms of, you know, have there been any new policies or dismantling of the tongue? Is there one thing in particular that has you very concerned, or do you think we should just relax and not worry about it? Um, well, it's a good question. You know, uh, and and yes, you know, I, well, I, I follow what's going on in Washington to some extent the same way everybody else does. I also work there for a while, so I have a few friends who are embedded, you know, in the system, uh, and we, we talk occasionally, actually more than occasionally. Um, so what? I mean, there's there's a lot going on. That's worrisome. Uh, you know, the, the budget cuts in the State Department are, are really uh, going to have a big impact on our ability to, to do this kind of uh, negotiation. Uh, budget cuts in EPA are enormous. Uh, DOE, uh, you know, the dismantling of these scientific advisory panels. Some are being actually dismantled. Some are being uh, stocked with industry people. Uh, which I think is, uh, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's true, yes, industry people should have a seat at the table, but, uh, you know, what they're doing is they're kicking all the scientists off and they're, and they're putting, you know, they're, they're putting foxes in charge of the hen houses, uh, and I think that's how it is. Uh, and, you know, this, uh, the National Climate Assessment is something that a lot of people are following closely, as I mentioned, there was an article about it uh, in the New York Times a week or two ago. Uh, I mean, it's a very that is a very interesting process because that the, the climate assessment itself is something that uh, has to be released by law, uh, and so a lot of folks are watching, waiting, uh, and uh, if it doesn't happen, that's supposed to happen next year. Uh, if it doesn't happen, uh, there's going to be lawsuits. Um, so yeah, it's there's. <coughs> There's, there's a lot going on. And a lot of, you know, people on the inside are struggling. Uh, you know, do I stay in fight or do I, do I get out? And it's a certainly a tough decision. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to stay if you don't believe in what your organization is doing anymore. Uh, you know, on, the argument is, of course, well, maybe I can do some good. But you know, I think you inevitably, I think, get put in positions where you're making you know, compromises and, I was wondering about solar panels. How do you feel about them? Because I understand that they're filled with heavy metals, and when they have to be recycled, they're going to contaminate the landfills, and that's going to be a big issue. You know, I, I actually, I, I can't speak. I, you know, I, I can't speak accurately to that. Uh, to be honest with you, you know, you hear this and you hear also people say, oh, the greenhouse gases emissions from manufacturing the panels are enormous. I know that that's not true. Uh, I have to say I love, you know, I love solar panels. I think it's just wonderful. And, uh, you know, as I showed you, we have lots of them. Lots of research. And I mean, it's a really, really cheap way uh, to get power. Nobody, you know, windmills, unfortunately, in some places are controversial. They are in, in town. I love solar panels, and you know they have these very uh, innovative uh, financing mechanisms where you, you can get solar panels in the house without putting any money down. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's great. I, you know the, the environmental consequences of disposing of them. I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I, I just can't. I just can't answer that. Sure. Um, I think read an article.
Uh, and also, you know, the, the other issue is, is so-called ocean acidification. The carbon dioxide, you know, it's wonderful that all that carbon dioxide is not in the atmosphere during the climate change, but it is acidifying the ocean. Uh, and that does have consequences. Now, you, you, you asked about changes in ocean circulation, and would that affect uh, the ability of the ocean to store carbon? I think not so much. One more, one more question. Well, someone way, way, way in the back, because you can haul your question loud. Uh, me? Okay. <laughs> what can small towns around here do with climate change? What can small towns around here that we live in do about climate change? You know, a small town is a good, I live in a small town now. Um, I think it's, it's great if you can think about Think about the town becoming energy neutral. Analyze, analyze your emissions, where they come from. Uh, can you arrange to purchase uh, green power? You probably can. Uh, can you do something to encourage use of electric vehicles? Can you put in charging stations, things like that? Um, I think there's things you can do. You know, town of Falmouth has a, a climate action uh, uh, committee, I think they call it. Uh, and you know we've done some good things, and not everything, not everything's worked out well. Actually, I mentioned we had problems with windmills, but we, we put in a big, uh, big new uh, solar generating facility uh, near our uh, and, and and you know so we're taking some steps. I'm sure that whatever small town you live in uh, could as well. So thank you very much, though. Uh, you know, let me reinforce, uh, get in touch with your representatives, uh, even in places where you think your representative isn't going to vote the right way, sometimes they surprise you. Uh, so uh, be active, uh, enjoy the evening, and come back soon.